Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, we'll tell you about critical vulnerabilities in popular password managers like LastPass, how Russian hackers breach the NASDAQ, and how you can pull off a man-in-the-middle attack for an SSH connection. And then it's a fantastic batch of your questions, our answers, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 171 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on July 17th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, Ting, DigitalOcean, and IX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this year's show goes on. Our live stream, why, that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. You've got to go check that out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, man. Welcome back. It's good to have you back. How was your trip? Good. I had a good time. You've been back a couple of days, right? Yep. And uh, did, Getting you caught up. Did, you get, did you manage to score any interviews while you're over there? Yes. Uh, we got Robert Watson, Dag Erling Smorgrave, and uh, the chairman of Zinus, okay. who's Eric LeBlanc. Well, all right. All right. I look forward to seeing those on BSD now. I'll tell you, Alan. Well, yes, because you- uh, we actually have a news story about Robert Watson later in the show. <laughs> it was it, it was like it was uh, meant to be that we were off last week. Um, my wife, Angela, came down with strep. And mm. like I had to go home Thursday afternoon to help take care of the kids because she was not feeling well at all, obviously. Right. So, I mean, we would have had a serious schedule conflict because I left here like around 1.30 uh, last Thursday. Well, yep. which would normally be when we're live doing tech snap, but because we'd pre-recorded, so that the streak continues. So even the one week where the streak would have been interrupted, we had pre-taped, and everything was fine. It was unbelievable. So here we are, 171 episodes in a row, Alan. And uh, yep. our first one, our first story that we're going to start with this week, hits close to home because both you and I are LastPass users. Indeed. So what's going on with this story? Uh, so some uh, four researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, have done a manual analysis of the five most popular uh, online password storage systems mm-hmm. and found problems with every one of them. Uh-oh. Uh, so they tested LastPass, RoboForm, My One Password, Password Box, and Need My Password. And they found uh, at least one problem with each one of them. All right, lay it on me, on. I'm bracing uh, myself. And so obviously the findings are pretty troubling because every one of the popular services has a problem. And uh, they start out their article with something. Uh, widespread adoption of insecure password managers could make things worse than, you know, obviously people not using password managers and having one password for everything is already a big problem. Uh-huh. But everybody using a password manager that has a problem could be even worse uh, because adding a new untested single point of failure to the web authentication ecosystem. After all, a vulnerability in a password manager could allow an attacker to steal all of the passwords for a user in a single swoop. Right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's so a tasty the, malware target, too, because if you can get on... See exactly. This, with local password managers, if the user authenticates, maybe there's a clipboard capture that happens or something like that, malware running local on the box could still exploit a completely secure password vault if, if the exactly. right cer- set, set of circumstances were to happen. Right. So obviously the users need to consider more than just using a password vault, but they have to keep malware off their system in the first place. But Mm -hmm. uh, the researchers found problems with each of the different services, including uh, problems with the bookmarklets that I think three out of the five services offer, uh, website vulnerabilities in the actual websites of the services, especially, you know, when you log in and do stuff, Mm. uh, including cross-site request forgeries, which basically... When you're on one website, it can be in the background talking to LastPass and doing stuff on your behalf using your cookies when you didn't want it to. Ah. Uh, and cross-site scripting where, you know, uh, you go to LastPass or RoboForm or whatever and it can pull in code from somewhere else and do stuff in the context that's not supposed to. Um, user interface vulnerabilities. So when you're actually interacting with the program where you could accidentally do stuff or accidentally allow stuff or, you know, just the user interface makes it possible to do stuff you shouldn't. And also authorization vulnerabilities, which we'll talk about a little bit later, okay. uh, which were one of the most alarming ones. Uh, so the paper shows how uh, an attacker might be able to steal a LastPass user's Dropbox password when the user visits the attacker's website. So uh, I think it's about page 10 or so uh, into the PDF, and it kind of shows this diagram explaining the, the series of interactions going back and forth with how LastPass manages 
storing your encrypted password database without ever having your master password. Mm. Uh, and basically, some of the encryption is done in JavaScript and so on, and, and the attacker on their site might be able to uh, pull out certain variables out of the JavaScript and get not your master password, but some of the stuff they need in order to be able to uh, extract your last pass or uh, a password for a specific site out of your vault. In I this see. case, uh, the example was Dropbox. Dropbox, yeah. So when you're at www.evil.com, they might be able <laughs> to get your Dropbox password out of LastPass. Uh, they also talk about a vulnerability in the one-time password system from LastPass, uh, where an attacker specifically targeting you, uh, they need to know your LastPass username, which I think is normally your email address, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and how they could uh, access the encrypted LastPass database. So basically what uh, happens is the way the one-time passwords work is because LastPass doesn't know your master password, they can't verify uh, the key as easily. So uh, basically with using the JavaScript, they could extract one of the values and then make up a fake master key and uh, generate this one-time password that then would get authorized uh, to access your vault. Now, they wouldn't, so they'd be able to connect and download the vault, but they wouldn't be able to decrypt it because they don't actually have your master password. Uh, however, once they have the encrypted vault, they could do an offline attack and just try to brute force it. Uh, especially, you know, your LastPass password is the one password you actually have to remember. So it might not be nearly as long as your actual LastPass passwords that you use for the different sites, right? Normally, you generate nice long passwords sure. uh, for use on the sites when you're using LastPass, but your actual LastPass password is the one you have to remember, so it's not always as long. And so that might actually make it easier for, uh, it's, it's the easier one to brute force because it's not necessarily as long. Uh, the other thing is there's just a privacy problem there where the attacker gets a list of all the sites where you have accounts and have saved the password in LastPass. They don't have the password yet, but they have a list of all the sites, which could make spear phishing easier or you know social engineering or just you know, knowing what sites you uh, have passwords and accounts on, right? And then lastly, um, they can delete credentials, uh, even though they're not authenticated. Wow. They, they don't have the right one, but they have a valid one-time password. Oh, that would screw so me up so bad. In, but yeah, so it, it's what they actually labeled it as a denial of service attack because yes. they could stop you from being able to log in to everything else by deleting credentials. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that could, you know, lock you out of another site. Especially uh, if they did something like, if you used LastPass for, say, your Gmail and your Twitter, well, if they go and delete your Gmail and your Twitter password out of your LastPass, you can then go to Twitter and try to reset the password, and they send the email to your Gmail, which you can't log into because you don't have that password. Uh, straight up, Alan, most major websites, I don't even know what my password is. I just have LastPass Right, that's kind of the point of it's, LastPass. They're crazy, right? right? They're, there's no way I would memorize those. Exactly. Um, then there's an authorization vulnerability in myonelogin.com yeah. uh, that can allow an attacker to share a web card, which is what they call the credentials you save, okay. uh, that they don't actually own. So just by knowing the ID of the web card, uh, you could actually share it with someone else. So you could share one you don't own to your second dummy account or something. Um, and because the IDs are basically just a database counter, it's a globally unique number that just keeps going up. They could actually share credentials that don't exist yet so that when they then get created, uh, they have access to them. Hmm. Uh, and it basically they talked about how if they retroactively share uh, the ID of your password card or your web card, uh, they wouldn't be able to read it because it won't be encrypted to their key. But the next time you update that web card, uh, it'll then be encrypted to the public key of the people it's been shared to because uh, that's how the sharing feature works. And uh, because of that, then the attacker would have access to your stored credentials. And so what they showed that you could do was um, you know, share the credentials that you've already saved, and but I wouldn't be able to read them yet, but I would be able to change them. Right, so if I apply a change, it'll then encrypt the password I set back to your public key, so that you can have access to it. So now I save the wrong password. So then you go and you reset your password, or know what the password is, and type in or whatever. And so you update that card with the right password again. But now, because it's been shared with me, it now gets encrypted to both of our keys, and I have access to your password now. Uh, 
but they say that uh, since their analysis was manual, it's possible that there are many more vulnerabilities than the ones they uncovered. These oh. are the ones they did by hand. Oh. Um, and it, there's a, a table that kind of shows the different types of vulnerabilities and which sites had which ones. And you can see every site had at least two different types. <laughs> um, they said, of the five vendors whose products were tested, only uh, need my password didn't respond when they were contacted uh, and responsibly sharing the findings. Uh, the other four sites have fixed the vulnerabilities within a few days of them being disclosed. So the problems with LastPass and My1Password and so on are already fixed. Right. LastPass uh, jumped on it, right? Yes. Uh, all the sites except for um, Need My Password uh, responded to researchers, took the information, and worked with them to solve all the problems. Yeah, you probably So should. everything described in the paper is solved, as far as I know. I don't know about the Need My Password one because they didn't respond. Right. Uh, the, although that some... More stuff could have happened since uh, when the article was published for Usenix. I just, I mean, I don't know if I'd want to use a service called Need My Password. <laughs> <That sounds Yeah. laughs> like, I don't, what do you, you guys, Especially why do you need my password? Especially when they don't respond to security researchers who yeah. have found vulnerabilities. But, no kidding. But yeah, uh, so, the, you know, that last one there, the My One Password, that's an authorization thing. Basically, uh, they verify that the username and password you're logging into their site are correct, but then they don't verify that you actually should have access to the card that you're doing certain operations to. Uh, so it just shows that, you know, they, because they kind of assume that anybody calling their API would be coming from their app, not a malicious person. And that's a bad assumption. Right? You want to check that people are actually allowed to do the thing they're trying to do every time they try to do it, not yeah. just assume that only a user who owns a web card would be trying to share it with somebody else. Right. Because obviously I'm happy to share uh, all of your web cards with myself. That seems pretty obvious in retrospect. Well, I've actually found a vulnerability like this before. There used to be a client, a, a service kind of like Twitter uh, that was originally launched by Kevin Rose. Oh, right. Remember the T. What was it called? Oh, yeah, yeah. And you could share music files on there pretty easily and stuff. I know, uh, but it had messages. Plunk? Was it Plunk? Plunk? No. no, I'm pretty sure it started with a T. Okay. It was written in Adobe Air and was, like, horrible. Yeah, chat room, help us remember, because, yeah, he launched it with uh, that I have gal. it in my Gmail account somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, it had a problem with its API, and I managed to read all of his, all the messages that were sent to him or sent by him, one of the two, because his user ID was, like, one. Oh, So huh. I just went through and just like brute forced through the thing. Yeah. And so you're saying you hacked Kevin Rose's uh, whatever it was account? Well, no, I used the API to yeah. read all of his messages and a couple <laughs> other people. Well, oh, did I you get anything good? To them. Uh, not really, no. They're mostly just test messages and stuff. Uh, I disclosed it to them and they fixed it uh, back then. But I'm checking his Wikipedia page right now to see if, uh, he, to see if they have it listed on here. Uh, I think it changed its name once to Pounce. It was Pounce. Pounce. Yes, it was Pounce. Yep, it was Pounce. There it yes. is. There it is. I found it. Yeah. Gosh, that that's a that's a callback. Two thousand and seven. It feels like oh, the site's not even up anymore. <laughs> the site's just totally down now. <laughs> you crashed well, yeah, them it's out. Been, no, it's been gone for a long time. Boy, it's a sad day when I get that before the chat room does. Wake up, chat room. What's up? I you guys should have gotten that minutes before I did. Come on, come on. Yeah, Pounce was like 2008. Yeah, yeah, 2007 actually. Well, yeah. 2008 was when I oh, disclosed. Oh, yeah, yeah, 2007 was when it launched, yeah. Wow, Alan. Yeah, it goes to show you that uh, sometimes you can just repeat the same mistakes over and over again and yep. nobody learns. Uh, well, they actually talk about that a bit in the uh, paper, talking about anti-patterns, basically things that programmers do a lot that they shouldn't. Oh, uh, so th they're actually describing what are called anti-patterns. This is a list of things you shouldn't do. And uh, basically, you know, like cross-site request forgery and cross-site scripting is stuff that we've seen over and over and over again for the last 10 years. And it just keeps happening because people make the same mistakes. Fascinating. It's a, it's a, it, this is, they, did you say that they, uh, they found these vulnerabilities in 2013? Did you mention that? And that they, they fixed them immediately, but the research paper took that long before it actually came out, I think, is what I, what I gathered from the article. So LastPass okay. knew about this for a while, but they figured since they didn't believe anybody was ever affected by these flaws, they didn't have any... Yeah, they, they didn't see any, but because uh, some of them required knowing the LastPass username, so they would have expected to see brute force people trying to guess usernames or stuff, and uh, they didn't see any patterns like that, so they don't think anybody used uh, these vulnerabilities, or anyone found these vulnerabilities other than the researchers. Yeah, so they let them but, run with it and disclose um, it and whatnot. They... 
those same researchers, or uh, three of the four of them anyway, I think, uh, no, all of them, they had a previous article called The Emperor's New Password Manager, uh, which is, I think this is based on that, uh, but it came out about the same time as well. And, uh, you know, the, like all papers, at the bottom of their paper are the references to 43 other papers, <laughs> including uh, some talk uh, with LastPass and so on. But yes, there's uh, quite good research being done, and it's good to see stuff like that. And it reminds me of a story from Cambridge, actually. Uh, you remember when we talked about the, uh, the chip and pin system in the UK and how there was a problem with it, and the one guy had to sue his bank and prove that he was in a different country at the time and wasn't the guy that took the money out of the yes, ATM? Yes, yes. Because it, he, a, a pin had been used, or a pin wasn't actually used, but it was logged in the bank as it had or whatever. Well... Uh, when I was at Cambridge, um, uh, on the Friday, I was in this, uh, I got invited to like the professor's lounge uh, and they have them and like the, I think grad students or whatever, the very last year of students that are doing research stuff. Uh, and they just were hanging out and they were like drinking beer and, and eating the leftover pastries from the <laughs> Dev Summit. Of course. Uh, and uh, I was with the the group of, um, I was with a couple of the FreeBSD people and their group of their students. Uh, that are working on various hardware stuff. But over beside us was another group, and it was two of the researchers that wrote that paper. Oh, cool. Yes. Uh, I didn't get a chance to get to interview them or anything, but uh, it was interesting to run into people whose papers you have talked about on TechSnap before. Yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah, it's funny when you bump into people like, oh, yeah, you, you, uh, you're that guy we've talked about. Yeah, you're that guy that wrote that paper and hacked all the ATMs. Mm-hmm. Because you remember, they actually went and like bought a used ATM and tore it apart. And yeah, stuff. yeah, that was cool. Yeah, it was just very interesting to very to enlightening run too. into those people yeah. in person. That is neat. All right, Alan, any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no, that's about it. All right, well, then I'll take a minute and thank our first sponsor this week, and that's the great folks over at Ting. Go to techsnap.ting.com. That'll take $25 off your first device. And if you've got a Ting-compatible device, they'll give you a $25 credit. That paid for more than my first month of Ting. TechSnap.Ting.com. And while you go there, check out their savings calculator because Ting does something pretty cool. They've got no contract and no early termination fee. But the part I love the most as a long-term customer now is it's a flat $6 a month for your phone. Now, I use my phone a lot, but I mostly use it on Wi-Fi. That, for me, makes it incredibly economical. But the best part is, like, I'm about to go on a trip to Oscon, and I'm going to go down to Portland. I won't be on Wi-Fi for a lot of that, but I know then I'll just pay for my usage. I don't need to pay in every single month to say like an 800 minute plan and maybe I use 400 minutes but just in case that one or two months a year I need 800 minutes I gotta pay the whole thing the whole time right that's stupid it's a scam they're taking your money go to techsnap.ting.com $25 off your first device and then it's a flat $6 after that if you're in a contract they have an early termination relief program you can find out more about that but try out that savings calculator plug in your actual usage your minutes your text messages, your megabytes, and your bill before taxes. Not what you pay for, because that's the scam. Put in what you actually use, and then see how much you can save by going to techsnap.ting.com. They also have a lot of really great devices that I think our audience might be particularly interested in. I cannot get over this fact. The Sanyo Red is now $52. That's off contract. <laughs> Ships wow. tomorrow. If you ordered it tonight, it would ship tomorrow. And then it is a $6 a month phone plan. That's a feature phone, yes, but if you just need to make calls, $52. That is an incredible value. Yeah, now, it goes up from there, right? Because you get the Sierra hotspot, $74. That's a hotspot, an LTE hotspot for $74, and it's it's a flat $6 a month after that. Now, you tell me if you're not in the sysadmin business or some sort of technical support business where you don't always need an internet connection, but you don't want to pay a bunch of money into something you don't use that often, or you don't want to have to pay for a bunch of megabytes that maybe you will use sometime and sometimes you won't, go get a $6 hotspot from Ting. Why not? It's a flat $6 a month plus your usage. Plus, then they go up from there. They got the iPhone 4, the iPhone 5. Of course, they got the great Samsung Galaxy line. They got the Nexus 5, the Nexus S, Alan's old, true, and hard, uh, long-lasting yep. phone. Uh, you just, which you just recently replaced, too, which are in the well, process I of replacing. Well, I replaced it. Yeah. I just <laughs> happened to... Got yourself... A, is it the, called the Flame? Yes, the, the flame. Firefox Flame. Nice, Alcatel Alan. And, uh, nice. I, uh, I put it's, Fire... it's really a developer phone, but... Yeah. I just figured uh, it I play was with it cheap a bit. and cool and has double dual SIM cards and stuff. And I'm like, hmm, 
if I'm going to the U.S. a lot, I should just get a U.S. SIM and my Canadian SIM. That way I can have Ting even when I'm in Canada. Good thinking, Alan, and a good thinking. There's lots of great options at Ting, too, if you want to just grab a dedicated Ting device. They got the S5. Oh, man, and the new HTC M8. You buy that sucker, you own it. It's yours. You don't have to worry about subsidizing it over two years. And, like, would you do that with your computer if you bought a computer? Of course not. TechSnap. Dot ting dot com. Check them out. Read their blog. See the latest updates from the company. Get an insight to how they work. And if you have any questions, call them. 1-855-TING-FTW. Anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And a real Canadian answers the phone. Mm. I know, Alan. I like those Canadians, too. 1-855-TING-FTW. You can also find them on Twitter. Ting FTW on Twitter as well. Included with every single Ting line, hotspot, tethering, picture messaging, caller ID, all the stuff your phone supports. Ting just, there's no reason for them to hide it from you. TechSnap.Ting.com. And a really big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Love it for well well over a year. Like, well yep. over a year now. Loving it. And that dashboard. That dashboard. It's worth it just for that. Okay, on. You know, you know me. This next story, man, did this grab my attention. How Russian hackers stole the NASDAQ. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, we had talked a little bit about this uh, in a previous episode, actually. But all we had was a statement from NASDAQ, which says, that, oh, this one application, we found some spyware in this one application. And, no bigs. And it was no big deal. And no bigs. As far as we know, nothing was stolen, uh, which, as we've talked about before, you never assume nothing was stolen. Right. It's like, we can't prove anything was stolen. It's like, well, if you can't prove it wasn't stolen, then you assume have to assume it was, it was yeah. stolen. <laughs> but anyway. So back in October of 2010... Uh, it's almost ten, uh, four years ago now. Uh, the FBI uh, has a system that was monitoring U.S. internet traffic and picked up an alert uh, from NASDAQ. And they said the alert prompted the National Security Agency, the NSA, uh, around uh, January of 2011. Okay. Uh, so they looked into it and concluded that there was a significant danger. Uh, the Secret Service had notified NASDAQ about suspicious activity prior to this. And they suspected that the new activity might be related, so they requested to take uh, the lead on the investigation, uh, but were denied and basically shut out of the investigation. Ouch. In which I can only assume was an interagency pissing match. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Funny how those happen. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, you know, the Secret Service has been involved in a lot of these breaches. They're fairly good at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe things would have went better if they had been allowed to participate at least instead of just being shut out. But yeah, I mean, what's one of the things you get from the articles you read through it is there's a bit of a calamity at times. They don't really know what's going on sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, obviously each agency felt that what had happened was a big deal, but in their sphere of influence, not the other guy's sphere of influence. Right, right. Right. The NSA thought, oh, it's, you know, state sponsored and they're trying to sabotage this and that. the FBI is like, oh, it's cyber criminals are trying to steal all the money. Right. And so each agency has their own biases and stuff. Yep. And there's one quote here. Uh, We've seen a nation state gain access to at least one of our stock exchangers. Uh, I'll put it that way. It's not crystal clear what their final objective was. Uh, so when these apparently Russian people broke into the stock exchange, um, they were never able to figure out exactly what they wanted. Were they there to steal money? Were they there to sabotage uh, the stock market? Or were they there to steal the software that runs the stock market. Or we see what's going on. Maybe just watch, yeah. right? Get reconnaissance. Uh, so Bloomberg Businessweek, which is people that are writing this story, uh, says spent several months interviewing more than two dozen people about the NASDAQ attack and its aftermath, uh, which has never been fully reported. Uh, nine of the people were directly involved in the investigation and the national security deliberations. None of them were authorized to speak on the record about the investigation. They never uh, are, of course. The, the assistant director of the New York FBI said the investigation into the NASDAQ intrusion is ongoing. Still. Uh, but apparently the hackers used two different zero-day vulnerabilities in combination to compromise machines on the NASDAQ network. Uh, the NSA claimed that they had seen very similar malware in the past, which had been designed and built by the Federal Security Service, or the FSB, of Russia, mm -hmm. uh, which is the country's main spy agency. It's the uh, replacement for the... Uh, KGB? KGB, yes. Um, later in the investigation, some U.S. officials questioned whether the NSA was pushing the evidence too far, uh, claiming that it was the FSB that broke into the NASDAQ. Uh, malware often changes hands, right? It's sold, stolen, or shared. And the uh, technical differences between attack code and stuff that's 
you know, just malware or cybercrimeware uh, is very small. So mm -hmm. it's hard to tell whether, you know, this piece of malware is designed to take out the stock exchange or to just siphon off data for, for the purpose of making money. Yeah, uh, that I mean, so uh, a couple of things are jumping out at me here right now. Um, it seems like uh, pretty good timing to have a great hit piece against the Russians. <laughs> yeah. Don't you think? Like, just like, so yeah. I'm sure that's a coincidence. Uh, at the time, the NSA director, Keith Alexander, and its agency uh, were locked in a fight with the government uh, over how much power the NSA should have to protect private companies oh. from this new form of aggression. So this is all pre-Snowden. So, right. Uh, and at this point, the NSA is trying to get more power. And so it was in their interest to claim that these attackers were, it was the FSB and they were trying to sabotage the NASDAQ and take out the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and everybody else is like, I think the NSA is stretching the evidence a bit. It doesn't seem to actually prove that. Uh, so uh, while the hack was successfully disrupted, it reveals how vulnerable financial exchanges, as well as banks, chemical refineries, water plants, and electric utilities are to digital assaults. Uh, one official who experienced the event firsthand says he thought the attack would change everything and that it would force the U.S. to get serious about preparing for a new era of conflict by computer. He was obviously wrong. Because <laughs> mm. as we've seen, not much has changed at all. Uh, when the investigators, uh, or sorry, what the investigators found inside NASDAQ shocked them. Um, according to both law enforcement and private contractors who were hired uh, by NASDAQ to aid in the investigations, agents found the tracks of several different groups operating freely within NASDAQ's network, uh, some of which may have been in the exchange network for years, oh. including criminal hackers and Chinese cyber spies. Uh, basic records of daily activities, like audit logs, uh, of what was occurring on the company's servers, which would have helped the investigator trace the hacker's movement, were almost non-existent. Womp womp. They didn't have any kind of auditing or logging. And so everything the different attackers did wasn't really recorded. So they couldn't separate what was normal traffic and what wasn't, and what was each of these different attackers that happened to be inside the network at once. Uh, investigators also discovered that the website run by One Liberty Plaza, which is the... Um, building that the NASDAQ offices are in. Uh, so the building management company runs its own website. Uh, and then that website had been compromised and laced with Russian-made exploit kit known as Black Hole, which we've talked about many, many times on yeah, TechSnap. Yeah, So they basically... So they've tracked it back to Black a, Hole. They did a watering hole attack on the website of the building uh, that would infect the tenants when they visit the page to pay bills uh, or, you know... Put you know, in reports saying that there's a leak in this window. Could you fix it or whatever? That's pretty genius because you figure a lot of big buildings have something like that. It's probably an internal thing. It's not super yeah. secure because it's just like, you know, it's just the building's website for just the occupants of the building. It's not like some yeah, big public site. Exactly. Yeah, the occupants of the building go there to pay their bills. That's and a few hundred people. No big deal. Do their usage or, or maybe, you know, control the air conditioning or... It, it literally could be as few as maybe 100 people in a big building, right? Because it's just the office yeah. managers of each individual office that probably be going there or the, the owner or whatever it'd be a very right. small set of so people each little office and so they can you know rent uh pay their rent or or you know put in a maintenance request saying there's a yeah. you know, leak in this window or whatever right. uh but they used it as a watering hole attack used black hole to infect the machines of the people that visited the website it's pretty clever so then they could then get into the secure networks of each office and hop around and, and go further yeah. uh, an fbi team and market regulators analyzed thousands of trades uh, using algorithms to determine if information from Director's Desk, which is the one of the applications that was compromised, that's the one that the NASDAQ told us about a couple of, uh, when they announced this like two years ago, or not two years ago, maybe one year ago. They only told us about this attack not that long ago. But anyway, uh, so the FBI and the market regulators, which is usually like the SEC, uh, looked at what information Director's Desk had and we're trying to see if it was used to make any trades for the purpose of, you know, trading on insider information or something. Uh, but they found no evidence that that had happened. So it's not clear that what the Russians got in there and what they got, they actually were able to use to make any money. Uh, by mid-2011, investigators began to conclude that the Russians weren't trying to sabotage the NASDAQ, but in fact, they wanted to clone it. Uh, at the time... Uh, Russia was trying to merge its two fledgling stock exchanges into one new one and trying to become a, a like a big market and a big power in uh, Eastern Europe. And so that 
then the conclusion was maybe they were just trying to steal the software that runs the NASDAQ so they could do it, so they could have their own exchange. Although it doesn't seem like that would work very well. Like you, stealing compiled code doesn't usually help very much. Yeah. Right? You would need, maybe they could get the source code as well. I don't know. But it just seems like it'd be fairly hard to steal the code for a stock exchange and then yeah. adapt it and make it run yeah. in Cerulean. At, at best, maybe you could see how the internals talk to each other and the, the yeah. network is and laid stuff. out. And yeah. So maybe, you know, maybe it was just reconnaissance for that. Yeah. Hard to say. I don't know. Uh, I mean, without a clear picture of exactly what data was taken from the NASDAQ and where it went, it's impossible, uh, which is impossible given the lack of logs and other vital forensic information. Not everyone was convinced uh, of that it was just the Russians stealing the NASDAQ code either. Well, like so would, nobody, would, nobody agrees on what happened. Would you want to base your uh, system on one that's so obviously vulnerable to attack? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I mean, that's just not a good idea. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, they were. Uh, I, I've never seen Bloomberg do this. I'm not a huge Bloomberg reader, so maybe I just never noticed it before. But up on the story, they have the different covers they were going to go with for this story, and all of them, except for the one they went with, have big, huge pictures of Putin's face, and it's it's straight up looks like classic World War II propaganda. I have it up on the screen <laughs> right now. It's. I mean, this is a very heavily handed like Russia, 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 and the only reason I'm a little skeptical is because. Some of the U.S. state-sponsored attacks we've talked about, in those cases, especially uh, in, in, in regards to the Snowden leaks, the U.S. will intentionally use malware that, if they get caught, doesn't look like it's linked back to them. Like, they'll sometimes use less sophisticated malware intentionally, so that way if it's found, it, it doesn't reveal the extent of capabilities that they have. They will sometimes use Chinese malware to exactly. make it look if, like if the Chinese. If you're Russia and you're trying to attack the U.S., you fill your code with fake Chinese comments. I think the, I think the one thing that uh, we sometimes maybe do is we don't give Russian intelligence services enough credit. They're pretty smart and pretty sophisticated. It would be a pretty right. big... I mean, you're essentially leaving your finger, fingerprints all over the crime if you use something like Black Hole because everybody knows that's a Russian-derived piece well, of malware. Well, Black Hole wasn't, Russia, that wasn't government-made. Right. So that one doesn't actually point at Russia. It right. was one of the other pieces of malware. But the, but the article says it's, it's a Russian piece of malware, so they still tie well, it to Russia. But, right. But the, the black hole, not so much. But some of the other malware, the more sophisticated ones that were actually used on the NASDAQ machines as opposed to the ones that were just used on yeah. the website. Because, like they mentioned, there were multiple groups. So the people that infected the building management website with black hole might not have been the yeah. guys that installed the <laughs> FSB-style malware Jeez. on the other thing. Jeez, and then. Yeah, so there was like criminals, Chinese state-sponsored, maybe Chinese criminals, Russian criminals, and uh, Russian state-sponsored attackers all mucking around in there. So it's hard to tell who did what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Interestingly enough, and I don't doubt that the NASDAQ was breached either, right? I mean, that seems like such well, a yes. target. Yeah, well, there's yeah, there's much proof of that. It just comes down to... Who uh, and why? <laughs> trying to figure out what happened and what their goal was. And even if it was the Russians, was it maybe slightly exaggerated? Because you have two different stories here. Obviously, Nasdaq's on the com the Nasdaq public release on the total opposite end of this article. The Nasdaq public release is like no big deal, hardly anything to worry about. They yeah, gave it like only a, affected like two hundred customers. Yeah, they gave like a, use this director's desk no, software, yeah, which is just fine. for sharing information between the directors of a company. It really has nothing to do with the stock exchange. They didn't even feel they needed to go more than just filed a brief the first time it came out and like they just filed a brief and that was it and then they touched on it once again so that's their version it's so minor they didn't even do anything other than just ma have a brief about it and then you have the flip side where it says several times in this article that president obama himself was involved with the discussions around what to do about yeah this. he had to be brief because of that you know there was a potential that some other country was yeah. trying to sabotage the stock exchange so, except for which as is far it? as they were able to conclude that wasn't actually the case so you got obama you got you got the nsa and and the CIA even got involved. They talk about how they involved the CIA yeah, to get on-the-ground assets. Exactly. But each agency was pushing towards giving themselves more power and yeah. to make to to phase or to to look at the threat through a lens that made it their responsibility and that they needed more resources to combat this type of of See, attack. I would argue that this exact this is exactly why we really haven't had any kind of coordinated response to 
realistic cyber threats. I can't even believe I'm using the word cyber now. But because it's one of these things where uh, if they want us to take it seriously, then stop exaggerating, stop the infighting, and you know, tell us technically what actually happened. Because if you want the technical community to arm ourselves, you need to give us details. And I maybe this is their argument but to make In this case, I think they didn't have the details because there was no auditing and logging going on. So they have no idea right. what happened. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that could be the case. I mean, it, it just I feel like part of the blame for our, the as a nation not being prepared enough lies squarely on the shoulders of these interagency bickering uh, fests. You know what I'm saying? Like they, yes. them, them, like pumping the media up to scare people, and then the internal fighting. Just try to get a bigger budget for themselves, yes. or or more power for themselves. But exactly. it, it erodes the public's trust in what they're saying, and so then nobody really has the motivation to do anything. Yeah, there, there's that, and there's you know also the fact that uh, it doesn't all work properly yet. Well, there's that too. And as soon as you come up with a way to, to, to make the most unhackable system, somebody easily finds a way to hack it by using speakers and a microphone. <laughs> so, you know, it's speakers like, and a microphone. what are you going to do? Hey, Alan, any other thoughts on that story? And I, if you guys want to no, read it, it's a, a five-page yeah, write-up in Business Week. And, and it's not just stretched out to five pages. It's actually yeah, they got, and they got Yeah, they got, they got interviews up in there and uh, quotes. Lots and all, of quotes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, all right. Well, then I'll take a second. I'll thank our next sponsor. That's the great folks over at DigitalOcean. Go over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code SNAPJULY. SNAPJULY will get you a $10 credit, and then uh, you'll be off to the races. Trust me, because DigitalOcean is awesome. It's a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can get started. You, Alan, you're not going to believe this. Mm -hmm. Corky, I think Corky's in the chat room right now. He got a new cloud server spun up in 32 seconds in DigitalOcean's new London data center. Yeah, they, I'll tell you about that. Yeah, just check this out. DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and now London. They just launched it. It's super rocking right now. Users can create a cloud server usually in about 55 seconds, unless you're quirky. And pricing plans start only $5 per month. That gets you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, a blazing fast CPU, and a terabyte of dedicated transfer hook to blazing fast internet connections in tier one data centers all over the world. Their interface is simple. Control panel is intuitive, and power users can replicate it on a larger scale with their straightforward API. Congratulations to DigitalOcean, too, for launching a new data center. That is a, you know, behind the scenes, that was a massive undertaking. You guys know yep. how much work that is. And uh, you can go up there right now. You log into the DigitalOcean dashboard. You get up and running in seconds. Create your first droplet. Deploy it to any of their many data centers. Take advantage of the snapshots, the templating, the backups, the one application deployments, all sitting on top of KVM with blazing fast speeds. And when you use that promo code SNAPJULY, you'll get that $10 credit. You can try out their $5 rig for two months, and you'll find, too, that DigitalOcean is a great go-to when you need a little extra scaling for a little bit. You got a test you want to do, have a few people work on it. Maybe you're working with folks all over the world. Instead of having to set up forwarding ports into your network, just launch a DigitalOcean droplet. $5 a month. I think pricing plans go up there, and as you go up in, in pricing tiers, you get more storage, more bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. It's a really smooth system. You'll have no problem understanding what you're paying for and why you're paying for it. And then when you need to do like a little DNS management or take snapshots before you make a big change, you'll be amazed at how intuitive that interface is. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code SNAPJULY to get that $10 credit. That also lets them know you really appreciate them supporting the TechSnap program, keeping us on the air. DigitalOcean.com. SNAPJULY. And a really big thank you to DigitalOcean. And congratulations, you guys, on launching that new data center. The TechSnap audience... Yep understands what you just went through, sysadmins, over DigitalOcean. <laughs> we appreciate you guys. Good job. And uh, there's surprisingly how many people in our audience are spinning up London. I, you know what? I want to do it. I want to put a BitTorrent sync server over in London. Why not? $5 and I have, a, I have, a, I have my, my, my data backed up on a completely different continent. Yeah, I'm doing that. <laughs> that, that makes sense. DigitalOcean.com. Sure. Snap July. All right, Alan. So uh, moving right along, we've got something a little different on the TechSnap program, a uh, little tutorial on an SSH man-in-the-middle downgrade attack. Bring it, yes, Alan. Uh, this is a uh, kind of multi-angle thing. Uh, but yes, uh, I saw this. Uh, it came to me through LinkedIn or something, uh, one of the groups I'm in. But uh, it's a tutorial over at OG150.com uh, that describes how to do an SSH man-in-the-middle downgrade attack. Uh, to capture the username and password uh, someone's using to log into SSH. Okay. Uh, so the tutorial is on how to perform this attack. 
uh, which basically involves tricking the user into connecting. Uh, so when the user is trying to connect to a certain SSH server, you're intercepting the connection. So usually this requires you to be on either the same LAN as the user or the same LAN as the server in order to, you know, ARP spoofing or whatever to, to or ARP poisoning to, to intercept the connection. Uh, but basically what it, you do is as the data is going back and forth between the user and the server they're actually trying to talk to, um, you change the very initial header of the SSH connection to instead of saying this server supports uh, SSH 1 or 2, you say it only supports SSH 1. <laughs> and that'll cause a client that's normally set to prefer to but do one if the server only supports one right. to use SSH 1, which right. is old and broken. It's just trying to be helpful. Yeah. Uh, so then the user, uh, because it's using SSH1, it uses a different SSH fingerprint. So instead of getting that big nasty pop-up saying, hey, you might be getting a man in the middle attack, this key doesn't match what we have cached, mm -hmm. it says, I've never seen this key before because SSH1 has a separate set of keys. Gosh, right. Or fingerprints. Yes. So you don't get the scary warning, you get that this is the first time you connected to this server yeah. warning. Yep. Which, A, if it's the first time the user's connecting to that server, they expect that. <laughs> True. Or... If it's not their regular machine, they're like, oh, maybe I didn't log into this machine from here before or whatever, right? And so most users are kind of just blindly accept that when it's, when it's not the scary one, when it's just that, do you want to accept this key? Most people don't bother actually verifying that. Especially when you're in a rush. You know, exactly. you're really trying to get something fixed real quick. And so now that you've tricked the user into dropping to SSH1, uh, when they log in with their username and password, you can intercept those and see them. Uh, and the tutorial actually goes through explaining how it was done. Now, most modern SSH servers don't allow SSH1. Uh, like, it's been disabled in OpenSSH for quite a long time. So even when I tried, you know, one of my old servers that isn't as updated, it doesn't uh, allow you to try to connect yeah, good, the, uh, good. the older version. But a lot of embedded devices oh, still allow it because they don't use OpenSSH. They use one of the embedded ones. Uh, in, the, in the example, in the PDF here, he's just connecting to a, a Cisco wireless access point mm -hmm. that still supports SSH1. And it also mentions there's some uh, Cisco security appliances that only support SSH1. <laughs> security appliance at that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and a bunch of stuff like that. Um, so uh, what they recommend is that some clients, especially uh, Putty for Windows, are the default is to try two but fall back to one, uh, and you should go and change that setting so it only ever uses two, so that this can't happen to you, right? This way, your client will be like, "Hey, you requested SSH two, and the server says it can only do one, and in that case, you want to not connect rather than connect and and have your session be intercepted." Mm -hmm. And uh, if you haven't already, you should double check that your SSH server is only accepting SSH2 connections and not one connection so that this can't be done to one of your users. This is so clever. It's so obvious in a way too, but I honestly never so, even crossed my mind. Yeah, uh, this can't actually be done too effectively against that many things anymore, but there are still some things it can. And it's also just interesting to do as an exercise. So if you're interested in security research and stuff like that, you could, you know, go set up a VM and purposely enable SSH1 right. on the VM and then perform this tutorial and actually, you know, be able to intercept your own password and be like, hey, that's how that worked. I give a plug, too, for uh, Kali Linux. We had an interview with the core developer of Kali Linux on Sunday's Linux nice. Action Show. And go grab that, throw it in a VM. It has all the tools yeah, you need. Yeah, they actually uh, talk about using that in the tutorials. Yeah, so. the, the guy was, uh, we had a really great chat in that show. So if you guys haven't seen that, go check out, uh, I think it was 321 of Linux Action Show. I'm yeah. not sure. Uh, wow. Yes. Uh, you know, this would have been great like back in the day because uh, I, I know a lot of my older boxes, you know, mm, mid 2000s definitely had SSH1 turned on by default. Definitely yeah. did. It was, it was on by default for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And it never even crossed my mind to trick a client into auto downgrade. I know most of the clients will just auto downgrade. That's pretty tricky. I like that. Yep. So, uh, Alan yeah, has. Even. Uh, OpenSSH from like 2008 uh, was two only by default. So like OpenSSH five and up at least, possibly even older. So it's not that likely you could actually do this against someone who's actually SSHing into a machine that you probably want to get into, but uh, especially uh, embedded hardware, you definitely have the potential for that here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's definitely where you're still going to be able to bang on this for sure. 
Gosh, in like, the bedded hardware. I wonder, I, I can test it right now, but I'm wondering if the SSH daemon on the, um, the power management system we have here in my basement, uh, so we have a, a power distribution unit that you can connect to over SSH or a web interface and turn ports on and off to do remote reboot of machines. Probably. And I'm wondering if that one will take an SSH1 connection. It might. It might. Exactly. And so if someone were, you know, you can expect somewhere like that might have something set up automated so that, you know, Mm. um, not DigitalOcean per se, but a company kind of like that might have a system like this so that a user goes to the website, does something, and then it automatically triggers an SSH to go to that thing and and cycle the port and reboot the server or something. Yeah, yeah, sure. And... uh, an attacker might be able to listen in on that connection or intercept the connection, get the password, and then be able to go in there and turn all the servers off or something. Oh, that would be funny. Yeah. Get uh, get right on that switch. Jeez, <laughs> there you go. So this is uh, TechSnap's gentle reminder that if SSH1 is enabled on any box that you control, do whatever you can to turn it off. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also to just check the settings on your client uh, right. and make yep. sure that it's not going to allow that so that you don't get tricked. That's also really good. Uh, I don't. I guess that would be on Linux. That'd be in the client config, and on Putty, it's probably just a checkbox, huh? Yeah. Um, for the the client config by default for OpenSSH, the client would be etc ssh ssh underscore config, yeah. and the server is etc ssh ssh d underscore config. Right. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna double check on my clients. You know, as I go to each box. I mean, no reason it'll have uh, version one support on any of my clients. So. Yeah. I don't connect to any boxes. Hey, I want to tell you about some boxes that you might want to check out over at ixsystems.com slash techsnap, our last sponsor of the TechSnap program, and honestly, a great company if you're out there and yep. you're in the need for any kind of enterprise-grade hardware for your home or for your business. Go over to ixsystems.com slash techsnap. They have some of the best systems in the business powered by those awesome new Intel processors. They have a white yes. glove experience that will save you time in the long run, and they're people that really know, really, really know what they're talking about. In fact, yeah, that's the biggest thing. I'm going to meet a couple of people, at least Denise, uh, on oh, uh, oh. on Tuesday. So that'll be cool. I get to meet some yes. IX Systems folks. They'll be at OSCON. And they just posted, I don't know if you saw this, Alan, they just unveiled their all-new TrueNAS Unified Storage Appliance line. Yes. A new line. Uh, yeah, it's buddy. really nice. Uh, so the TrueNAS, the difference over FreeNAS is more enterprise So uh, you have two separate heads, uh, machines, that are then each connected to all to all of your different disks. If you remember when we showed that machine that had like the 700 petabytes or terabytes yeah. or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Um, that one had like three separate chassis that just full of disks. And then one on top and one on the bottom were the controlling machines that were then wired into all of those disks. So that either one of those can be turned off to do upgrades or if it crashes or if the hardware dies or whatever. Any one of those two can be off at the same time. So that and all your files are still accessible, and all your VMs running off of it are going to stay up, and nothing's going to break. Love it. Uh, well, with the new one, they actually built that into one of the uh, Supermicro twin cases, so that it's actually uh, two separate machines in one case. Uh, so it, you know, fits in your rat, and it looks beautiful. You see the pictures of it? Yes, dude, it looks yes. awesome. <laughs> Man, IX system is just really on a streak these days. And the other nice thing with the TrueNAS is, depending on your needs, you can buy just the one head to begin with and then upgrade it to be HA in the future. That is you know, killer. If, if you need to save money to start up, but you know that you're going to want high availability as you uh, you know, start deploying stuff. Yeah, you know, when I need 1.15 petabytes, which is what the uh, TrueNAS Z35 will go up to, I mean, sure, I could start... Yeah. At 240 terabytes, if I wanted to. Plus, it has like you can get a four terabyte uh, flash read cache. Wow. That'd be your L2 arc. <laughs> a four terabyte. Fl- wow. You know, ixsystems.com's got everything from the uh, free NAS Mini, which is what we run here at the JB Studios for our yes, back end CFS is storage. A, a low cost little machine that you can stick under your desk or under yep. your TV or whatever yep. and gives you all the great features. You even got the Intel Server Atom processor that can do that uh, encryption one. offload. Yeah, yeah, it does encryption offload and, and uh, virtual, can virtual virtualization too. The V2 yep, it has all the all the stuff. Uh, there's a, a VirtualBox template for FreeNAS now. I know people ask this. Uh, like when we used to talk about FreeNAS a lot more, uh, people would always ask, you know, can I run virtualization on my right, right, right. FreeNAS so yeah. that that machine can host all my files and do that? It can now. Yeah, now it can. Uh, there's a template now for VirtualBox so you can set it up. So that you can actually run VMs directly on top of your FreeNAS machine. And do you know does it support VTD? Do you know if that I Atom processor so. does? So you get direct access to the disk. I'm not sure, but either way, well, that's for hardware pass through. Yeah. Uh, well, if you're running it FreeNAS and then 
using the VM to run that other stuff on top of it, you would want FreeNAS to have the disk, not the other I thing. I suppose so, so, yeah. It's not required, but I'm pretty sure it does have that, yes. It's a server-based Atom processor, yeah, so I was just thinking, really like, if, if I wanted to carve off a little bit of disk, and there's just a lot of flexibility you can do there with their new rig, and that's yep. what I truly uh, but like the about. new FreeNAS, you also have the option of the newer uh, iSCSI server. Oh. Uh, the one that's built in the kernel in FreeBSD, and it's uh, oh. getting lots and lots fancier. iX Systems is just, like, I tell you, they're the go-to place now. And you can get started by going to yep. ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Just visiting that page is like, a, hey, guys, uh, here's my hit to say I vote for supporting TechSnap. And then you can check them out. Gre download the ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source. This is a white paper that has 11 key traits you must absolutely demand from your provider. If you want to help convince maybe somebody up above you in your organizational chain that some of the standard OEMs that they might be inclined to go with are not exactly a good fit, and you probably exactly. have lots of reasons. We could tell you many of our reasons, but I'm sure you have your own. This white paper will help you seal the deal ixsystems.com slash techsnap. And a really huge thank you to ixsystems for being so damn cool and for sponsoring yes. the TechSnap program. And I can't wait to see you at OSCON next week, guys. Um, and hey, you know, I noticed our chat room has been talking about one thing that broke today, kind of throughout the whole show, and that is the massive round of 18,000 layoffs that will be hitting Microsoft over the next 12 months. Um, we did cover the details in uh, Tech Talk Today, episode 28. That aired this morning. And um, it's kind of funny because I was sort of predicting all week long, starting Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, that Microsoft would be making huge announcements about layoffs this week. And it hit this morning. And we kind of did our analysis in episode 28 of Tech Talk today. If you're sort of still chewing on the whole Microsoft layoff thing and what it means, you know, we're right here in Microsoft's backyard. And both mm -hmm. Eric and I have friends and family who work at Microsoft. And so we chatted a little bit about it in episode 28 of Tech Talk today. And also... Just for you BSD-inclined folks, guess what was just posted as we were going on the air, episode 46 of that BSD Now program? Yes, uh, we have a great interview uh, with Brian Drury uh, from the Porsche Manager team. He's one of the people that's been doing all the work on the package management system, PKG. Oh. Yes, we've nice. been trying to get him on an interview for a while. Uh, our plan was to get him at BSD Cam, but then he was too tired from all the hacking he was doing <laughs> on the package system. Hey, so, can't blame him for that. Exactly. <laughs> Very good. Episode 46 of BSD Now. All right, Alan, with the news all done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website, or even better, starting a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Alan, our first email comes from James L. And guess what? It's a ZFS question. I put the ZFS questions up top. Yep. He says, as I understand it, ZFA, ZFS or ZFS acts more like a database than it does a traditional file system. Data is written to the transaction log, the ZIL, before it commits the write. If this is correct, then how or can we roll back a transaction similar to like an Oracle database? I.e., if someone did an RM star, can the transaction log be used to roll back the transaction and recover your data? Okay, so there's... The transaction groups and the ZIL are not the same thing. So yes, things are written in ZFS in transaction groups, which are atomic, which just means that if you're in the middle of writing a transaction group and the machine crashes or the power goes out or whatever, then that transaction group gets undone. So instead of leaving you in this position where you have like half of the file or something, it goes back to when the file was perfect and the last transaction group. And by default, transaction groups are at least every five seconds. So it'll create a transaction group every five seconds unless it gets full first, then it'll write it more quickly. Okay. Uh, and so that way you have uh, this consistency. That way, uh, so instead of having to do an FSDK or something, because instead of overwriting stuff in place where you can get what's called a shorn write, which is, you know, you have your file and you're overwriting it and you get halfway done and then the power goes out. Now mm. you have half the new file and half the old file. Or a disk so error, one, controller error, right? Right. So this one, because it's, it writes the data to a new place, if that doesn't finish, then it just pretends that didn't happen and you have what the file looked like one second ago before you were trying to overwrite it once you reboot. And that's why it doesn't have to do any kind of consistency check when it boots up. It just uh, returns to the state the last time it was perfect which is no more than five seconds ago. Now, the ZFS uh, 
intent log, the ZIL, is a special thing that's only used for synchronous writes. So asynchronous writes, if you're just copying a file to it, like, you know, I'm copying a file from this computer over the network to my ZFS storage, that doesn't use the ZIL. That just gets written to the disk normally. But if you have a database or some other application that does what's called a synchronous write, so normally uh, there's a system call on Unix called write, and you call it when you want to write data. And so you say, you know, write this data to this file. And normally, as soon as you call that, it goes on a list of things to do and your program keeps working, right? So the program keeps going after that and the file system will eventually write that out to the disk and it'll be fine. Yeah. But you can set a flag called sync uh, that says, when I call this write system call, stop and wait until that's done before I do the next thing. Okay. Databases use this so that they will know, you know, you know when you're doing a transaction in your database, they don't want to return until they're sure that this data is all the way on the disk and safe. Uh, right? So in those, if you have a special dedicated log device in ZFS, like a really fast SSD, instead of having to wait for the hard drives to write out the data from your database change, it writes them to the SSD, which is faster, and as soon as they're written to the SSD, they're now, the data is now safe, the program, the database can continue and do its next thing. And then ZFS can pull that up into a nice big write and flush it out to the disk later. But for most file system stuff, like in a file server, you almost never use the ZIL because hmm. it's your, all your writes are asynchronous. But for database and stuff, you have the ZIL. And so it's just designed to speed up applications that are going to wait until the data is all the way on the disk before they continue. So instead of having to wait for the slow spinning disk, it goes to the small SSD, which only buffers a little bit of the data, and then it gets sorted and put in all in order and all nice and then written out to the disk later, usually only uh, a couple of seconds later. But this way, it can deal with bursts and it can deal with um, random writes and yeah, stuff like that. That's a smart design. Um, yeah, so it allows you to have your database still be fast, but not require you to buy all SSD storage. I have a unrelated question, but it was sent in by a viewer that didn't make it into the show. But I was also wondering: mm -hmm. uh, Is there is when you have a say you have a ZFS file system mounted? Let's say I was going to make everything that went into, into this area on my disk is all going to be virtual machine images. Can I disable copy on write for a particular mount or pool? Or? No, uh, because then it can't guarantee the consistency of the data. Right. I was just curious if that was there a reason it. you wanted to disable copy on write. Well, I remember last week we got an email uh, from a viewer who was right. experiencing. But remember, when it's copy on write, you're not copying the entire file. Right. You're actually not copying anything. It just means when you write, don't overwrite. Put it in a different spot and right. then change the pointer. Yeah. And then and then that old spot becomes free, and you write the next thing there. So other than causing a bit of fragmentation, it doesn't actually impact performance as opposed to overwriting. There you go. I was just curious. I wasn't sure if it was a possibility at all. Uh, all right. Our next one comes in from Chris T. And he wants to know what Alan would do. He says, hi, Chris and Alan. Thanks for the great show. Keep it up. I'm building a free NAS box for my home office. I've specced it out with a 4th gen i3 CPU, 32 gigabytes of ECC RAM, 128 gigabyte SSD for the L2 ARC, and a discrete gigabit NIC. My question is this. With seven four terabyte drives, would you choose RAID Z2 with a hot spare or RAID Z3? Or maybe another configuration entirely? My use case is nothing extraordinary. I'm just going to be streaming some media, doing backups for my PCs, NFS shares, and a few VM disk images. I'd like a good balance of data integrity and performance, but data integrity always wins if there's a tie. Well, if you're after integrity, then obviously Z3 has the advantage. Um, you could just do Z2, and you would get five out of seven disks for storage space. There you go. So um, you think that's a good compromise? It can be. Uh, I usually just use Z2 because that's, you know, being able to withstand losing two drives at once is good enough. Yeah. Although if you need to be absolutely sure, Z3 is a great option. Yeah, um, yeah. Like right now where our free NAS server is, I'm not even kidding. It might be 100 degrees in that room. So those drives could pop wow. at any time. So we could yeah, lose multiple so, drives at once. But uh, uh, if you're worried, uh, I guess one of the reasons you probably was thinking about the seven disc, you should consider this or that. Um, Matt Ahrens wrote a great article about ZFS stripe width, uh, which is the one people are always worried about. And it actually explains exactly how it uh, 
should be set up oh. or, or what the advantage and disadvantage of each different setup is. So I'll add a link to that. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that ex- Chris explains that in more a- detail uh, the, the impact of the different uh, stripe width. Nice. Uh, but Alan's off-the-cuff recommendation was Z3 well, is yeah, going to give you depends. the best. but Yeah, Z3 is the uh, best safety. But number uh, two is probably good enough unless you are worried about losing more than two discs, two discs at once. Right. Um, and then for performance, it depends. If you only have a gigabit NIC, then performance isn't going to be, uh, like streaming performance isn't going to be that big impact. Uh, I have six uh, three terabyte drives. Oh, I, thought gonna Z2. I thought you were going to say NICs. I thought you were going to say NICs. Actually, my file server does have six NICs, although one of them got hit by lightning. <laughs> oh, geez, that's right. It's got a four port NIC and then two onboard ones, but one of the onboard ones got hit by lightning. Um, anyway. Uh, with those six disks, I can streaming, you know, eight or sixteen gig files or whatever, uh, reading in a straight line. I can get six or seven hundred megabytes a second, whereas my LAN can only do one hundred and twenty-five megabytes a second. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, when you do start doing random, that your numbers won't be as good. Uh, if you're um, more worried about performance, then mirror groups will be better. Uh, so you could do, you know, three sets of three pairs of mirrors with the one extra or whatever. Uh, the other advantage to mirrors is uh, flexibility. If you want to upgrade in the future, it's easier to do with mirrors, right? If you, you have seven drives, if you add an eighth, now you're going to get that you can do that fourth mirror set or whatever, right? When you do RAID Z, you kind of, if you want to in- expand it, you kind of have to add a, a second RAID Z, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then... Which means you got to buy a certain amount of drives. Yeah, you, yeah, you'd have to buy at least four or five drives <laughs> uh, for your expansion, or ideally the equal number of drives. Uh, although that's not that big of a deal. You shouldn't mix the types, but yeah. So you're looking at buying more and more drives to be able to expand it. Whereas with RAID, uh, with mirror sets, you can only you can do it two drives at a time. It also makes upgrading easier. If you know they come up with the new six terabyte drives, uh, you can replace just two of the drives with six terabyte drives, and now that'll expand. And then you can, you know, possibly even just add those extra two terabyte drives to it as well. So mirrors give you the best flexibility and the best performance, but RAID Z gives you the best uh, total space uh, usability. Right. Very and good. then the higher redundancy, you get a little bit less of that. But uh, All right, Christy, now that Alan's answered your question, I want a picture of your build submitted to the TechSnap subreddit just so we can check it out. Yeah, he's maxed out the RAM. An i3, I don't think, can take more than 32. So he's right right to the limit on how much RAM he could fit in that thing, (laughs) which is great. Yeah, good good on you, man. Mm -hmm. Uh, All right, so Boris writes in. Boris is also building a new PC. He wants to work with some VM. Actually, it's going to be a Zen VM. Uh, And here's the thing. It's for work, Mm -hmm. and he wants to use or needs to use Debian Stable for work. Uh, he's going to have six to, eight, six to eight disks and at least 16 gigs of RAM in this sucker. But here's his question. Since he has to use Debian, he wants to still use ZFS. He's, he doesn't want to not use ZFS. So he's curious if you have any thoughts on the difference between open ZFS and straight-up standard ZFS on BSD. He says, Alan's always talking about how ZFS pools should be built, but is there any difference in the build between Linux and BSD? And how should I create my pool if there is? And will 16 gigs of RAM be enough? For six to eight disks, he thinks. He doesn't say the so size. He was asking about the difference between open ZFS and which ZFS? And the ZFS that ships in FreeBSD. Which is open ZFS. <laughs> it is uh, the, so they're actually not different. So, so I think so, where he's getting hung up, I think what he's getting confused about is like there's a couple different port options for Linux to, of ZFS, right? There's like the one you should go with, and then there's like a couple other ones, right? Possibly. Uh, so, well, originally there was ZFS from Sun, and that's what FreeBSD imported. Uh, and then when Sun stopped, that went, moved over to Illumos, which then nice. became yeah. Open ZFS. Okay. And so uh, that's what z- uh, ZFS on Linux, uh, the FreeBSD ZFS, the one that's in Illumos and SmartOS, and also the new um, Open ZFS on Mac OS X. Yeah. Are all based on the Open ZFS, which is actually going to have its own repo soon, but currently it's still part of Illumos. Um, and so those are all the same. So if you use the ZFS on Linux, that'll be the same ZFS as on FreeBSD. Now, the version, the feature supported will be slightly different because there's just a little bit of lag between when a feature gets written at one of the companies, then gets upstreamed into Illumos, and then gets downstreamed into FreeBSD and, uh, and ZFS on Linux and so on. Uh, so you might not have uh, 
you have to be careful when you create the pool to kind of go with the lowest common denominator of features so that it'll be importable on all your machines. Ah. But uh, it's really not that big of a deal. Good tip, though. Yeah. Um, uh, we- so, yes, he can just do that. Or he could use uh, the Debian K FreeBSD and then get uh, the FreeBSD version. But probably he can just go with the regular uh, ZFS on Linux and it's almost the same. It, It'll be the same as what's in FreeBSD 9.2. Okay. Uh, 9.3 came out today like or yesterday? Tuesday. Okay. So it has a couple of the new features, but I imagine those will be in the latest version of ZFS on Linux as well. Okay. You know, I just read on I read his email a little bit further. I think maybe one of the, one of the sources of his confusion is his work just had him recently complete Solaris training, and ah, so he's living in Solaris right now. So yes. Uh, so OpenZFS is basically a fork of of Solaris ZFS version 28 which is the last one that was open source. Uh, so that means we don't have the Oracle encryption system, although that's not the one that we were promised for ZFS anyway, so it's actually not that good. And I guess they also have support for larger block size, although we're getting even better larger block size support soon. Uh, Boom. But we have a lot of the other cool features that are in open ZFS, like the um, used space histograms that that help a lot with the the fragmentation and the, basically the performance when the pool gets near full. Oh, great. Uh, which used to be really bad and oh. is now much, much better. Great. Um, there's the right throttling uh, was a problem before. Basically, the way it worked before is once you were writing faster than the disk could keep up with, it would start just cut off the speed, uh, whereas now it kind of slowly eases it off and it, like it does. It, you get much better performance. I like that a lot. Yeah, uh, Matt Aaron's talked about it in our episode of BSD Now from May something. The one in the middle of May about ZFS is like two hours of him explaining all this stuff. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Boris yeah. says that he's also looking forward to his episode 200 shirt since he didn't manage to grab an episode 100 shirt. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Boris but yeah, awesome. um, So yeah, you can just use uh, just, um, the one from Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. It's uh, ZFS on Linux, I think it's called, .org. Uh, and that would be the best one to use. All right, Alan, put your professor's hat on because Joe writes in. He says, uh, I know this has been asked over and over and over again, even in various different Jupiter Broadcasting shows at that. If I've missed an episode where this has been thoroughly touched on, though, please let me know and I'll watch it. If not, it'd be amazing if you could sort of give us a segment or at least answer and feedback what it's, what it, uh, how to be a sysadmin. I want to be a Linux or BSD admin when I, quote unquote, grow up. Websites and blogs are full of guides, best practices, etc. on how to install debug stuff, but I haven't really found a resource that could really answer the questions, such as, what should you study if you want to be a sysadmin? What do you need to understand to be a good one? And if you were tasked with hiring a sysadmin to work with you, what would you expect from him or her? And could you also share some good or bad experiences? So, Alan, do you have any ideas on where to start with this one? It's a big couple topic. things. The first one I'm reminded of was just a funny quote I saw on Twitter the other day. Um, you know, being a sysadmin is kind of like doing the dishes. <laughs> You do it, and you feel like you've got something accomplished, and then you just realize there'll be more dishes tomorrow. Yeah, and people only notice when you don't do the dishes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing about being a sysadmin. you got to be prepared for that. So mentally, it's a, so, I it's guess a bit it, of a challenge. Just, yeah, the word sysadmin is kind of fairly generic. There are lots of kinds of sysadmins, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it could cover a whole variety of things. And mm-hmm. some stuff, you know, certain sysadmins might consider that outside their job, and other ones would be inside their job and so on. But the main things are usually, you know, setting up the systems, usually servers. Uh, so installing it, setting it up, adding the users, configure, uh, installing the applications like the web server and the database server, whatever. Uh, managing the configurations for those, creating the users. I think I already mentioned that. Uh, and managing the policies that enforce stuff like, you know, disk quotas or mm. managing the free space and setting up monitoring so you know when something goes wrong or when something goes down, you know. The IT department shouldn't be waiting for someone to call to tell them that something's not working. They should monitor it and find out ahead of time. Right. Although that's not always possible, but... Yeah. yeah. Whenever possible. So it really depends. Uh, As far as assessment on the BSD side, uh, there's the BSD certification course, uh, which has two parts now. There's the BSD... Sorry, the BSD associate exam, which is a written exam that covers the very basics. That's installing and updating the OS, creating the users, and and that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's a written exam. It costs uh, $75 at a conference or $150 at a testing center. Uh, and they're also working on now the BSD professional exam, which is a three-hour hands-on exam where uh, you start with one of their virtual machines of 
free net or uh, free BSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, or Dragonfly BSD, whichever one you prefer, and a list of tasks, and you have to accomplish them all, and then they check to make sure that you know you set up the DNS server that and it answers this record, and you set up a web server that returns this, and you set up a mail server that accepts mail for this address or whatever. Uh, so and. The study material for that is free on their website, and it, uh, they have like this overview of the things you're expected to know, and uh, that's a great resource as far as knowing what to what things you should be able to do. If you can go through that list and make sure you can do all those things, uh, then you then you're ready to be a sysadmin. It's also uh, it's about um, I don't know mental commitment isn't the right a, word. A bunch of it is, is just a certain way of thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's it's not you're, when when you're setting something up, you're not just thinking about how you're going to set it up. But it's also, I'm gonna. What happens if I have to set this up again? Right. Uh, how am I going to maintain this? Exactly. You know, yes. A month, a month from now, there's going to be an update. How am I going to handle that? And how am I going to handle this when I have five <clears throat> times the amount of work? Yeah, and also it's like, especially when you're selling an application, it's like, you know, a year from now, I'm going to have to upgrade this from version two to version three. Yeah. And it's going to be a big deal, and yeah. we want to make sure that we don't get stuck using an old version, and so we have to stay on top of that, and we have to you know, make sure that we don't end up in a situation where everything depends on this one machine so we can't ever reboot it and things like that. And it's uh, similar advice I give out to when people write in the code of radio and say, how do I start developing? It's like, find something you need. Maybe it's an IRC server. Maybe it's a XMPP server. Maybe it's uh, an own cloud box. Find something you want and install it and administer it and begin at the most basic level of installing packages, setting up servers, yep. getting an understanding of what it's like to keep something that's important to you running. Uh, I know yeah. one of the and things... I think uh, one of the things I recommend for that is as you're doing it, write down what you're doing. Oh, like yeah. In a, in a document Notes or are really and important. Once you get it all set up and working perfectly, delete it and do it again. <laughs> wow. That is hard advice, but very good advice. Yeah, and, and if you can do it the second time, uh, much quicker, you know, not having to look up tutorials or just going by the notes you wrote down. Uh, if you can get it to work the second time without any stumbles, then you know you actually know how to do it. And, and then keep that document because you'll need it a year from now when you forget how to do it. Well, if, I like your approach though because if you do force yourself to do it again, it will sink in a little more. And, you know, yes, and, and yeah, you'll just start to get more muscle memory at that kind of stuff. Exactly. You'll, you'll remember the parts that you actually need to do and not just all the stuff you read that you, where you get off on a tangent and stuff. Also, if you're good... And basically, just because you managed to do it once yeah. doesn't mean... <laughs> you're not a sysadmin. <laughs> because you know, the way you wrote it down, yeah. you, know, you might have accidentally done something that made it work. Right. Or something. So yeah. only by or validating your instructions, miss your documentation, something. by being able to do it again using only what you wrote down, yeah. uh, can you be sure that what you wrote down is good enough. And you will thank yourself, or the other people will thank you, uh, when they have to do that setup over again at 3 o'clock in the morning with only your documentation no to go on. Oh, my gosh. No kidding. And I'll tell you this, too. Uh, if you're good at interlocking dependencies mentally, like if you can say, okay, I need to do this, and then this is going to depend on... If you can sort that stuff pretty well, that's a good trait to have. If you're also yeah. good at being able to hyper-focus on the matter at hand but build and fix the matter at hand with the really big picture, like maybe a company's five-year plan in your mind, so that way you yeah, know you're building the infrastructure it's towards not just, that. Well, let's set up this. It's, let's set it up in such a way that uh, we can migrate it to another machine right. if we have to. Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can manage it and we can keep it separate from other users, but we can make it reusable enough so that if we have other users that need the same thing, I can copy it. And, and I can make it easy to upgrade, and yeah, a lot goes into it. And it gets very specific to the certain applications, and that's why different sysadmins will yes. kind of have different uh, strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, certain people are really good at dealing with storage and stuff, and other people are really good at Active this Directory or, that, right? or Exchange yeah. or databases. Yeah. Like, you know, my business partner has been big in email for ages, and so he, I just let him take care of the mail servers, even though I used to be pretty good at it myself. I've kind of. Good choice. This is not my area anymore because. Who wants it? <laughs> You know, let them have it. Is much let, more him, fun. let him have it, Alan. Let him have it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> is you know, talking to Matt Aaron's, one of the creators of ZFS, he was like, you know, the entire point of ZFS was to make the sysadmin's life easier, and oh. I would say they definitely did that. Good man, I appreciate that. All right, Steve writes in with our next question. I think our last question of the day. Hey, Chris and Alan, I'm catching up on some tech snap from the last couple of weeks, and I heard you mention DNS made easy for email backup. 
thank you for that. I've been running my own Zimbra mail server on DigitalOcean for the last several months, but I wondered how would I handle it if there was some downtime. So great suggestion. I signed up right after you guys mentioned it, and you probably just saved my bacon. On that note, I tried to implement what Alan says. If there aren't three copies, it's not a backup recently. I found out how right you are, Alan, and I was glad I had backups in triplicate. My client's QuickBooks server ended up corrupting their main database, and that got replicated locally to their local backup. Fortunately, I have also been backing this up via Spider Oak, which is fantastic. I've reviewed it on last. And as a result, they only lost a single day, a single day worth of transactions, thanks to revisioning. Yep. Thank you for the great show. And Alan, keep preaching it, brother. Eventually, yes. all the best practices you preach will stick. Steve-o. That, that's the big one. Is that it's not, a copy is not a backup. What you need for a backup is the revisioning. You have to be able to you know, step back through time and find the last time it was good. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, sometimes a, someone purposely deletes a file, accidentally deletes a file, or um, you know, a database gets corrupted or overwritten or something. And you need you might not find it for a couple of days. So you need to be able to step back a couple of days. Yeah, I saved and the day a few times with that. You know, like Excel files, spreadsheets uh, like that, you know, or even Access Database. I had it happen with an Access yep. Database. It takes them maybe sometimes five days before they even realize something went wrong. Yep. And, uh, yeah, and so uh, we talked about it the other day. We kind of had like the Delta T and the Delta R and stuff. It's like you need to look at how long... Um, can the backup take mm -hmm. and how long can it, uh, the restore take, mm -hmm. but also you have to look at how often you're doing the backup because in the example, their QuickBook things, maybe losing a day was a big deal or maybe it wasn't, mm -hmm. but maybe if they had had, you know, if their local backup was like hourly snapshots, maybe they would have done a lot better. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, you know, then send it off to spider oak once a day or something. Um, or, you know, if it's a really important database, maybe you should be snapshotting it every 10 minutes, but then maybe it takes, 12 minutes to copy the file from the one server to the other. And so you can't do and, it every 10 minutes. And how many revisions of that copy are you keeping? Are yeah. you overriding every time? Or are you keeping Depending on the, the setup, um, you might not be able to back it up while it's in use. <laughs> True. Now, with shadow copy and stuff, you can usually get away with it now. Yeah, but yeah. that used to be an issue. Yeah, yeah. So then if you can only copy it when it's not in use, then you can only back it up <sighs> outside of business hours <sighs> and stuff. Man, there's still a few things out there like that that just drives me crazy. Yeah. It's 2014. All right, Alan. Well, that wraps up our emails for this week. If you'd like to send us a question, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and choose TextNet from the drop down. We want all of your network, security, hardware, storage, sysadmin, anything like that. Anything you, Any topic you've heard us breach on this show, anything we've discussed, any stories, send it in. We want it. Just go over to Jupiter Broadcasting, click the contact link or links.techsnap.tv. That's our subreddit and start a thread there. Plus, then you'll get the input from the rest of the community. We had about five emails that didn't fit in this week's show. And I, a lot of, in a lot of cases, suggested that people. I had like five other news stories that didn't fit either. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's been two weeks since yeah. we did an episode. So yeah. well, we're catching uh, up. We're in catch up yeah, mode we, this week. There's a lot of cool stuff coming up next yeah. week as well. Yeah. So you, so I, I went through the batch of emails that I think we're going to have on air. So uh, we are at inbox zero for TechSnap. I, I recommended those folks go over to the subreddit to ask their questions. So please send in your questions so that way we got a whole new batch next week because we love reading your feedback. And now with the feedback all done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that just didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them and give you some links to go read some more on your own after the show. And a lot of these links came from our awesome subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Our first one makes me shake my head in anger. The Obama administration says the world's servers are their own. Fourth Amendment protections don't necessarily apply to data stored in the cloud when it's a U.S. company that runs those services. Your thoughts yeah, on this, In Alan? particular, it says, any company with operations in the United States must comply with valid warrants for data even if the content is stored overseas. Mm. So this particular one is coming up when uh, the government is uh, issuing a warrant to Microsoft for data that's actually stored on a server in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, now, Microsoft's contention with this is that um, the data technically doesn't belong to them but to their customer. And uh, so the warrant should have to go to the person who owns the data and they should have to ask them for the data um, as if the data was stored, you know, on the, in their offices instead of in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And it kind of makes sense. Now, you know, the government's uh, essentially the government makes these claims, although almost all of theirs are made up uh, are based on these like 
made up situations that could happen Scenarios. but never have happened. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's like, so well, if we ask the company uh, for the data, they might destroy it. It was like, well, the same thing can happen when you have a warrant for papers out of their office, but there's legal remedies against that. Mm-hmm. And it was like, well, yeah, but this is, a, we're trying to track down cyber criminals. It's like, well, the data you're requesting in this case is in the boat of cyber criminal. Right. And I, so, yes, you yeah. can understand, but. Yeah, but mostly Microsoft doesn't want to be giving over people's data under a gag order where they can't tell the person that their data is being given over. Whereas if the warrant had to be served to the person whose data it is, they're now aware of the fact that their data is being seized. Bingo. The the warrant laws specifically say that the person whose stuff is being taken has the right to know what is being taken. I agree with you. You used a soundboard on my show. I will beat you up. Hey, look (laughs) at that. What do I have right here in my hand? What is this? I don't know. It's oh, a, I can't actually see you. Oh, that's right. I didn't set that. It's a bell. Oh, so it's actually a, okay, okay. Yeah, I got a bell. Okay. <laughs> I cheated. <laughs> All right. You you don't have to be punished. Now. Anyway, uh, there was a, a great um, hearing about this on C-SPAN with uh, Paul Vixy, who's uh, one of the guys that you know helped invent DNS and a bunch of other things. Yeah, and you know what I actually get some encouragement from is companies like Apple, AT&T, Cisco, and Verizon all agree on this issue. Verizon, the PDF is linked in the article that we have linked in the show notes, said that a decision favoring the U.S. would produce dramatic conflict with foreign data protection laws. Apple and Cisco also said in their PDF that the tech sector is put at risk of being sanctioned by foreign governments and that the U.S. should seek cooperation with foreign nations via treaties, a position... Well, specifically, like, there's laws in the EU that say, you know... The data about an EU person can't just be given away to somebody without that person's permission. And then the U.S. government is trying to say, well, we can take data from about anybody from anywhere. And yeah, it kind of leaves Microsoft in this position where they can't be in compliance with both laws at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, and the uh, Irish government... And obviously the, the U.S. feels that they, their laws should be supreme. I mean, if <laughs> Even I... Even when it's a European person's data in a European data center. Yeah, uh, you yeah. know what? It's time to just for me, and I'm. I, I, if you, if people out there don't feel this way, I had no judgment. This is everybody's personal decision. But for me, I feel like it's maybe time to roll it back a little bit, bring it mm-hmm. in house, and just if I can't, you know, just I, I just I don't like this. I don't like the direction this is going. Um, and the thing that you said that I that I think is absolutely worth underscoring is if at least I set up my own physical file server, my own physical mail server in my house, they have to come knock on my door to serve me a warrant, and at least I know. I'm not. I'm not yes. be and, empowered and to do Microsoft, anything. But. Microsoft doesn't want to have. Well, partly just for business reasons, why have to deal with all these warrants and hire all these lawyers to deal with all the stuff when the government should be dealing directly with the people who own this data? Well, and let's be honest, it's going to decimate and, trust you know, in the U.S. They can tech do market. stuff. They could. They could send a note to Microsoft, being saying, you know, take a snapshot of this data in case a person tries to delete it or something. But they should still have to. Oh yeah. Get the data from the person who owns it. Hey, we're going like, through the legal process. Could you snapshot this user's account? And then yeah. Microsoft holds it, doesn't hand it over until the warrant is delivered. Problem yeah. solved. Or, well, they don't ever deliver it unless the user deletes it or something goes sideways or something. Yeah. But, yeah. My, but uh, th- there was, th- these points came up pretty well in the, uh, in the hearing. I don't know if, it's, if that's was, like recorded somewhere. It was on that? C-SPAN? Yeah, it was live on C-SPAN And 3. W- what was the guy's name? Uh, the senator, the person running it was like Senator Whitehouse. Do you remember the guest how do you, name? How do you, uh, well, the guest, it was uh, Paul Vixie, uh, somebody from Microsoft, somebody from Symantec, and somebody else. The reason I ask is because C-SPAN transcribes all the videos and then posts them online, ah. and you can search by transcription. So people could go look by their name. Um, okay, so backing up just a little bit. The primary thing I'm concerned with with this matter, and then we should move on because it's the roundup, yep. is destroying trust in the U.S. tech sector completely. Like, if I was a foreign uh, individual... Why, what would be my reason to want to use a U.S. tech company's product if there was an alternative that was based not out of the U.S. when you have these kinds of security issues to worry about? It just, to me, seems like as a company, maybe if I have trade secrets, like I'm a large company or something like that, this is a, this is a risk to my business, to my intellectual property, to my, inv- my innovations. It's a risk for espionage, all these things. And so it... Maybe never is an issue. Maybe it is, but it's going to erode trust regardless. And that—that that is really what the administration is doing by pushing on this like this. And it's like they're just all out there, whole hog now in the public saying we want it all. Yep. Anyways, good write up by ours. You guys can go read it. We'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, another article by ours, only a few days old, but OpenSSL 
uh, the fork of OpenSSL, LibreSSL, probably not good to run on Linux right now. Well, that's already been fixed. That's the funny thing. Yeah. Uh, so somebody found a, a bug where um, if you did a fork of a program and it had the same process ID, which is never supposed to be able to happen, but in a very contrived circumstance, you could make it happen. Um, you could, when you call the pseudo random number generator, you could get the same data twice because it uh, uses the process ID number as the, um, the to stir the pool and, and make the randomness different each time. Uh, because basically Linux doesn't have the extra random code that is used on OpenBSD, which is where LibreSSL is from. Mm -hmm. So in the portable version, the randomness was the pseudo random number generator was had a flaw or a weakness, and in a certain situation, which would probably never happen in production, uh, that could happen. So they've already released a new version that fixes that. Yeah, Theo Durat emailed ours and wrote this is like a few hours after they published. He said, "This is way overblown. This will never happen in real code." <laughs> so Theo's like, "Come on, guys, you just you're just trying to generate headlines based on my project. Come on." <laughs> yeah, but. Well, it's actually not his project, but yes. Yeah. I just, yeah. I mean, he's, yeah. Uh, okay, moving on. Got to keep going because we spent too much time on that first one. Rogers releases a new policy on disclosing subscriber information. You just got to come back yes. with a warrant. Yes. Uh, so basically, Rogers has updated their privacy policy saying that they will demand a warrant before they turn over customer data. Yay! What a concept. Yeah. Maybe this will catch on. I like this warrant <laughs> idea. That's a good idea. Yes. We should go that route. Especially, well, especially when warrants uh, specifically have to say exactly what you're looking for and that you're only allowed to take that. And if you take something else and use it, then it's all considered fruit of the poisonous tree and the case gets thrown out. Alan, can I convince you to stop using complicated passwords? Because Microsoft would like you to use weak passwords, actually. They don't want you to use complicated passwords, at least... Not on some sites. Microsoft says that users should reuse weak passwords for websites which don't hold any valuable information. Overturning decades of accumulated wisdom on internet security by not having to worry about remembering complex, unique passwords for every individual website, users can focus their efforts on recalling secure passwords for high-value sites like e-banking or e-commerce. Well, or you could use something like LastPass. Um, well, I understand what they're trying to say. You know, if your brain only can hold so many secure passwords, then don't waste them on things that aren't important. But there aren't that many sites that don't have at least some information you wouldn't want everybody to have. I know, right? You know, like every site is tracking and collecting data about you. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty hard to say that any of them, you know. That's really the problem like, is they all have data. How, how big a deal do you consider your Twitter account? Maybe it doesn't really contain anything that's sensitive, but it's very closely tied to your reputation maybe. You know, mm. things you say on there depending on who you are and how you use Twitter and so on. It could be a big deal, or it might not, it's hard to say. Alan, if you had any problems playing your Sony games, maybe you're trying to check SonyOnline.net. Sorry, their domain expired. Shenanigans yeah. ensued. Well, so SonyOnline.net isn't actually the, a domain you would ever go to. <laughs> it just have to. It's the ones that Sony bases all their name servers on. Mm. So it's the ones that are responsible for allowing you to look up the DNS of every other one of their domains. <laughs> So uh, this took out all their MMOs like EverQuest and PlanetSide. It took oh. out their forums, all their oh. websites, oh. everything. Oh. So basically, yeah, Sony forgot to renew their domain name. <laughs> and uh, basically in the Whois records, they had put an email address that nobody was reading. Uh, probably course. many years ago, right? They registered a domain for many years and, you know, they no, just that wasn't a valid email address anymore. And so they weren't getting the notices saying, hey, your domain's about to expire. And so it expired. I wonder if the same people renewing those domains were the same people that were supposed to be patching those Apache boxes back in yeah. the day. <laughs> well, because uh, I know for us, we actually have, in our Nagios, we monitor certain domains' expiration dates and our SSL certificate expiration times. Yes. So that if any of those gets within like two weeks of expiring, flags start going off so that we know to check it because, you know, uh, it's never happened to us, but uh, one of our ISPs had one of their SSL certificates expire. And it's like, I would love to go pay my bill, but I keep getting this pop-up from my browser saying, sorry, your certificate's expired. <laughs> no and good. it's just like, no that's good. embarrassing. I don't want that to ever happen to me. Hey, uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, Cisco wireless residential gateway boxes have remote code execution vulnerability right now. This is from a notice from Cisco. A vulnerability in the web server used in multiple Cisco wireless residential gateway products could allow unauthenticated remote attackers remote attackers to exploit a buffer overflow and guess, guess what? Cause arbitrary code execution. Yeah, the, the evil one here is the fact that it's remote. 
Uh, so that means that they don't have to be in your land to do it. <laughs> Although, does that require you to have enabled the the web administration interface on the public side or something? It must, because it says the vulnerability is due to incorrect input validation for HTTP requests. So if it's accepting HTTP requests so externally... It might, it might, you, you might have to actually be on the land to do this. They might, the word remote might be just slightly misused. Or, or, you know, have a different... But it's Cisco. <laughs> they should be getting that terminology right. Uh, the, the biggest thing is that I notice here in almost, in actually all of them, it's, it's like blah, 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 Doxis 3, blah, 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 cable modem, Doxis 3. So all of these are the ones that you most likely will get from your ISP, and it's also your modem. So you probably didn't even pick this Cisco device. It was provided by your ISP as part of your your cable service or whatever. You probably had to pay for it, but yeah, yeah. you didn't get to pick which one. This, and uh, they, so you probably, you might not even have the administrative password to manage it. They say here that uh, the vulnerability exists whether the device is configured in router mode or gateway mode. Uh, Cisco has scored the vulnerability in its advisory, so they say it's, they say it's uh, pretty severe, actually. I wonder if it is actually yeah, remote. It's CVSS score of 10 yeah. and a temporal score of 7.8. So those are uh, pretty big. Yeah. So, it, uh, and they have see they have network in there. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. If there are no current known workarounds. You just have to obtain the fixed software and update. Yeah. Uh, the other problem uh, is is when you execute the code, it crashes the web server. So then you can't get in it remotely to see what's going on because the web server for the administration is down. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, if they can do remote code execution, they could get a shell on their thing, and then they can use your cable modem to either look at, go into your network or to launch denial of service attacks or run spam bots or do man-in-the-middle attacks on all your connections. Yeah. Reroute your attempts to go to Google to, so that you get ads or, you know, hijack your bank traffic or whatever. Mm-hmm. Hey, Alan, is there an afterlife for online services? Where do they go when a service dies? Uh, this is just a, a story I came across about uh, Prodigy, which was uh, yeah. an internet service that wasn't quite the internet. It I, was kind of like one of those walled gardens back I had in the it day. for a little while. I never did, but... Um, uh, one guy kind of was trying to bring it back to life and using a hex editor on the old uh, executables was managed to extract a bunch of, uh, I wouldn't say interesting, but, you know, um, what do you call memories like that? Um, nostalgia stuff. and Nostalgia stuff, yeah. exactly. You know what's funny, though, is I, I might have the details wrong because I just glanced through this article, uh, but it sounds like Prodigy back in the day was saving screenshots of users' sessions. And so no, I think he was he was trying to get a screenshot of what it looked like because okay. there aren't very many of them online. No, there's really nobody, not. Nobody screenshots weren't a big thing back then because I don't even think JPEG was invented yet or was well. This was before yet. Windows was even popular. I mean, so exactly. yeah, you'd start and as so, DOS. So yeah, uh, so there's not even pictures of what Prodigy looked like for people to see. And so he was trying to take screenshots of it. Oh, man. Uh, but one of the other things they mentioned is that it might have been one of the first examples of a massive community just disappearing. Like, so there was these forums, basically, with all these messages, and when Prodigy shut down, they all just got deleted. And it was just like this giant chunk of the internet that just disappeared. Or this giant chunk of, of human culture that just disappeared. And how we still see that happening over and over. You know, if Reddit shut down tomorrow, how much of, you know, the culture of a, a, a certain group of people would just disappear off the internet? Oh my gosh, and looking at these screens brings me back so hard. This is <laughs> unbelievable. I'm looking at the login screen right now, and it just hit me. Like, I saw I that screen so many times. from, like, uh, ASCII art BBSs to, yeah. to, like, you know, Internet Explorer 4. I, uh, I had an interesting situation because my mom and dad were separated when this stuff was going on. And so at my mom's house, I had AOL. And at my dad's house, I had Prodigy and then later CompuServe. So I kind of got like, and then he got MSN. Did you, do you remember when MSN had their own dial-up service with their own MSN client? I remember client? when it was that. Yeah. I never used it. I, I went straight from using just BBSs to having, you know, regular unmitigated internet. I, uh, I convinced my dad to get the MSN service because they had an exclusive, this shows you how much of a long-time geek I am. They had an exclusive feature to the MSN service that you could only get if you were a Microsoft subscriber called the Star Trek Continuum. And it was an online Star Trek. It's basically Memory Alpha, but it was way back. There was no StarTrek.com or anything like that. And the exactly. only way you could there get was it. No, there was no Memory Alpha Wikipedia thing yeah. or anything like that. So you had to have MSN. Oh, man, this stuff takes me back. 
That is really something. Well, I'm really glad he's doing this because honestly, that was kind of a big part of my early internet life, and I haven't seen those screens since DOS was a thing. So that's how long it's been on that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I would love to grab. I, I don't remember the name of the terminal program I used to use to dial up my BBSs, but just yeah, to, to just see the main menu screen of Rebels Reef again would be something. I know. <laughs> Uh, hey, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Sherry. No, it's not a gal you can take out of the town. It's called Cherry, not Sherry. Oh, Cherry? Yeah, Cherry. I thought it was processor. Sherry. This, anyways, know, it's, it's a Cambridge Open Secure Processor design that they've yeah, made so, open, uh, right? Robert Watson, who was also uh, two weeks ago elected to the FreeBSD core team and is a member of the FreeBSD Foundation and a professor at Cambridge University, is leading a group, and they've just open source uh, everything for Sher uh, Cherry, which is a, a secure processor. Uh, so it kind of takes the idea of some of the Unix security models and specifically capabilities, uh, which came from Capsicum, which was actually originally invented by Robert Watson, um, and putting it in the processor. So having the processor actually create restrictions about like which applications can access which part of memory and enforcing security policy in the processor hardware. Uh, and so they actually provide the not just the like source code to... to for Cherry BSD, which is a version of FreeBSD for the Cherry, but actually for the design of the processor. So they have it in um, uh, Blue Spec Verilog, which is a like a designing language for for designing processors. So you can actually uh, compile the source code they give you down to C and run basically an emulation of this processor, which is very slow. Or if you have an FPGA, you can actually compile it down to, to Verilog and run it on the FPGA at about 100 megahertz. How oh, cool. Or you could actually use the design to fabricate an actual chip. Yeah, man. That is the way of the future right there. Yeah. And uh, there's another talk by uh, one of the students that was working on it, uh, Jonathan Woodruff, mm. that actually talks about building a tablet based on it. Nah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. There's a uh, video of the talk in the link to Jonathan's, uh, the, the video that yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, there's um, quite a bit of different stuff going on slides. here. But yeah, it has, uh, they got the paper, the Cherry capability, or Cherry capability model, reducing risk in the age of risk. Because <laughs> RIS, risk and then RISC, uh, yeah, which yeah. is the reduced instruction set computer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's basically a 64-bit processor that's able to boot and run FreeBSD and open source applications uh, using Clang and LLVM, but has fine-grained capability-based memory protection model uh, for each different Unix process. So one process can't access another process's memory. Amazing. So basically taking these ideas of like um, uh, attack mitigation that we're trying to implement in software and, and putting it actually in the hardware. Yeah, dude. And uh, they've open sourced everything, including right down to like laser cutting directions for actually building a tablet. Huh. They uh, they point to uh, heart bleed and the target breach. Eighty two percent of exploited software vulnerabilities. Uh, they want to help. They think they can help address. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a very interesting research project. Really good PDF too. With lots. Of, you know me. I like my pictures in my PDF, Alan. Oh, here's yeah. a picture of it. There's a couple of PDFs too. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a video, and yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. Oh, it gives me hope for the future when I see stuff like that. That's for sure. Good find, Alan. All right, last but not least, not a huge deal on this one, but uh, I know we have a few folks out in the audience that are failed to ban users. Uh, security update for failed to ban, uh, a solution to ban hosts that causes multiple authentication errors. When using fail ban to monitor Postfix or Cyprus, or Cyrus, I'm sorry, uh, IMAP logs. So not a huge, not going to affect a lot of people, but if you're a fail ban user, fail to ban user, I'm sorry, you might want to update to the latest version. And updates are rolling out everywhere. They just hit for Debian this morning, rolling out to all the distributions and places where fail to ban is found. So an important piece of software if you're using it, so it's worth updating it. Alan, well, I think... Well, actually, uh, that could actually be a pretty big deal looking at it. Oh, uh, yeah? So almost... Most mail servers are probably Postfix uh, or using the Cyrus IMAP uh, or the two of them together. And so with this, probably a large uh, amount, I yeah. as an attacker could cause fail to ban to trigger on your IP address. So using this, I could ban you from SSHing into your own server. That would definitely suck, Alan. Yes. Uh, or, you know, if I managed to compromise the server, I could then use this uh, to lock you out so that you couldn't kick me out. Um. But yeah, you could probably just brute force this and, and block, you know, if I happen to know you use Comcast, I'll just enumerate all of Comcast's IP addresses. And, and they just get anybody that has Postfix. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, specifically, I could just, 
you know, lock you out of your own boxes and stuff. Yes. Um, that's yes. why in my system like this, we actually, I have uh, certain exclusions or, or uh, in the firewall rules, I allow a certain block of IP addresses no matter what before uh, doing this. Although the downside of that is if somebody compromised one of those boxes, they could then brute force against one of my other boxes with no limits. Uh, but more so importantly, if something happens, so. if I fail my login a couple times in a row, I can always SSH into one of those machines and then bounce off and get back in and unban myself. Yeah, that's one of those things where you got to look at and say, what's more likely to happen? And in exactly. that scenario, that's that's a good idea. So, uh, yeah, if you're using it to monitor PostFix or Cyrus, you should probably do that. Get it FD. Yes. Probably be in your repo for whatever software manager you're using. Exactly. Uh, yeah, like the, looking at the CVEs, those are actually pretty old. Uh, they both say 2013. Yeah, on they them. do. Um, so I'm guessing that means that this has been known for a while and they were worried because of how bad this could be. Uh, so they left quite a bit of time to get the update out there yeah, no kidding, and make sure huh? people would get it before they announced it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Alan. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this week's episode, yes. 171, right there in the can. Now, don't forget, you can join us live. Head over to jblive.tv on a Thursday, 1 p.m. Pacific, which is... 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Boom. You can also go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, and our robots will automatically convert it to your local time zone with the magic of JavaScript and robots. You can also send us an email. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and that's where the magic of monkeys delivers your email to the right location. And we always blame the monkeys if we don't read your email, so it's a win-win. Um, monkeys are usually only used for the newsletter. Oh, yeah. Well, then what are all those monkeys doing with our email, then? What's happening over there, Alan? I better look into that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode of TechSnap. Don't forget to go to uh, links.techsnap.tv to help contribute to content you want to see in the show. And we also appreciate any reviews or comments you want to give us on iTunes. I know, iTunes. But that does help people find our show. We really appreciate that. And last but not least, we also have BitTorrent feeds. If you want to help defer some of the bandwidth costs and just grab the show over BitTorrent, why not? we got RSS feeds and direct downloads all linked in the show notes over jupiterbroadcasting.com. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning in this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs> <laughs>